It's working. <laughs> it's working. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Welcome. Uh, my name is Nancy McKenzie. I am the Executive Director of Customer Experience here at the John Public Library. And I'd like to begin tonight by taking a moment together to acknowledge this land that we're on, which is Treaty 4. Uh, the traditional lands of the Cree, Dakota, Nakoda, Lakota, Soto, and traditional homeland of the Métis. Uh, Regina Public Library is committed to working together uh, towards uh, reconciliation, collaboration, and change. Personally, I'm committed to educating myself and sharing what I learn. And tonight, we are here on Treaty 4 to learn about censorship. So let's start with the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which provides all citizens the right to explore different ideas, uh, hear all sides of an issue, and gather information to make informed decisions. Libraries provide resources and space to accommodate this exploration and discovery. At RPL, we value and protect every person's fundamental right, subject only to the Constitution and law, to have access to a full range of knowledge uh, imagination, ideas, opinions, and for people to be able to express their opinions publicly. Lately, uh, demand to censor books, speakers, and ideas are growing louder. Libraries and schools across the United States are facing an increasing number of challenges, and it's not just happening south of the border. A recent article in the Globe and Mail titled The Battle Over Books highlights the creep of censorship into Canada and reminds us that we aren't immune to its pervasiveness. James Turk, our speaker tonight, was quoted in the article as saying, there's literally been an explosion of challenges to intellectual freedom, to books, programs, and candidates, significantly inspired by what's happening in the United States. Uh, in Canada, we can form our own opinions about contentious topics, we can argue them with friends, we can lobby for change, we can stand on a street corner and protest. But when do our objections and actions start to impact the freedom of others? When have we crossed the line into censorship? And what far-reaching issues might we as a society encounter as a result? Tonight, James will share his expert knowledge of intellectual freedom to help us learn more about censorship and the need for intellectual freedom. He is a distinguished visiting scholar at the Toronto Metropolitan University and director of the University Centre for Free Expression. Previously, he served as executive director of Canadian Association of University Teachers and was an associate professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. James has written extensively on expressive freedom and has won numerous awards for his work. Uh, he also lists Regina as one of his favorite cities. <laughs> so, so before I turn things over to James, I just wanted to let you know a couple things. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions following James' presentation. Uh, we are recording this event, but just the presentation purposes, um, not the Q&A for privacy reasons, and the recording will be available on RPL's uh, YouTube station afterwards. Please, please, please fill in an evaluation when we're all done. We've got paper evaluations over here. We've got QR codes scattered throughout. You can fill it out on your phone if you wish. And with that, Thank you for attending, and please join me in welcoming James Turk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a delight to be here, and I want to thank you, Nancy, and I want to thank the library for inviting me and for you putting on this evening. And Regina is really one of my favorite cities in Canada. Uh, I had to give a talk in Saskatoon, and they said, are you going to tell people in Saskatoon? <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that Regina is one of your favorite cities. Um, and well, I didn't do that, but I didn't say Saskatoon is one of my favorite cities. I really love, I, I haven't been here. I've been here probably 25 times. I haven't been here uh, since the pandemic. And it feels, there's just something about this city that really is warm and welcoming and enjoyable. So thank you for the opportunity to be here again. Nancy's right. Um, about what's happening with regard to censorship is really coming to the forefront again. As I'm gonna tell you tonight, it's not an old phenomenon. I mean, it's not a new phenomenon, it's a very old phenomenon, but it seems to come in waves and we're in one of those waves right now. 
So, it, you know, and I'm gonna be using my PowerPoint, so I hope you can see the screens. Um, there's just a, a flood of, I just arbitrarily picked a few uh, news articles uh, that have come out recently about uh, challenges from across the country in the United States uh, in the province of New Brunswick, which has a has a provincial library system, they've had more challenges <clears throat> to their collection in the last five and a half weeks than they've had in the entire history of public libraries in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, the, there have been 72 challenges that we know of, there are many we don't, to drag story time events in public libraries in the last 12 months in Canada. In fact, on a proportionate basis, when you compare the data we're collecting on challenges to Canadian uh, items in Canadian libraries with the data from the United States, proportionally, we're having about 30% more challenges than they are. So, you know, we often look, I often look at the United States saying, well, that, fortunately, I live here, or that's not what's happening here. But there's some really troubling and worrisome things happening here. One of the architects in the United States of this, I mean, I showed you some headlines. Uh, in one county in Florida right now, there are more than 1.6 million books in Florida classrooms that are having to be reviewed by the school authorities to make sure they don't contravene the requirements of two new pieces of legislation in Florida, which have been, giving, been given really misleading names. One is called the Individual Freedom Act which is colloquially referred to as the Stop Woke Act. And it prevents the schools from having any books in their collection that suggest there may be systemic racism in the United States. And the second is the Parents' Rights and Education Act that prohibits any material that suggests that one should recognize gender identity and sexual orientation or use different gendered pronouns in schools and having any educational material that relates to that. But disturbing things are happening here in Southern Manitoba as we speak in the South Central Regional Library, which is the library that covers a number of small towns south of Winnipeg. Uh, there's been a push to have a number of books, primarily books on sex education for children and young adults, all of which are award-winning books amongst the most respected books of that type uh, in North America, removed from the library, from the public libraries. Uh, requests went to the library and their re request for reconsideration form to have those books removed. The library reviewed them, found that its selection criteria and choosing them had been right, that these were excellent books. And so the group pushing this then went to the town councils in each of the six towns where the South Central Regional Library has branches and insisted that the town defund the public library because it had these materials which would corrupt the values of young people. And what's especially worrisome, too, worrisome is two of the towns are actively considering doing precisely that. So it is a really serious issue here as well as there. Uh, the, the um, I mean, fortunately, this doesn't seem to have hit Saskatchewan yet. Hot spots in Canada are in British Columbia and in Manitoba, New Brunswick, and increasingly Ontario. And it's being pushed by a number of groups that have formed. Most of them started out as anti-masking, anti-vaxxer groups that now have turned to libraries and want to make sure that in the name of freedom, they are able to prevent the libraries from making various resources available that could be seen to be LGBTQ plus positive, trans positive, or be about sex education. The biggest one is called Action for Canada. It has 99, claims 99 chapters across the country, including seven in Saskatchewan. We don't know from any of those whether it's just one person who joined them or, or it's a, a number of people, and we know in some places a number of people, but others. And we were able to get financial data on them for 2021-22 in their earlier period. 
and they raised over eight, uh, about uh, eight hundred thousand dollars in donations to further their work. So we're seeing a lot of disturbing patterns and developments going on. One of the things about what's going on is challenges are coming from all sides. You see an image on your screen of a drag a performer at a drag queen story time. And as I say, there have been 72 uh, challenges to libraries holding these events. But equally, we see challenges coming from progressive folks like me, not me challenging, but folks who <laughs> I would identify in their values of anti-racism who are concerned about books like If I Ran the Zoo, uh, ran the zoo by Dr. Seuss uh, and are, saying, are demanding that those be removed from libraries. Conversely, there's huge attacks on a lot, as I mentioned, a lot of young adult books that are uh, about uh, LGBTQ people or, or trans folks. Uh, the most challenged book in North America is the one you see on your screen, uh, Gender Queer. It's a memoir of a person who grew up realizing they were non-binary and talking about their life. Um, but equally, there are challenges to the, bo the book I just put up by Abigail Schreier called Irreversible Damage. Uh, the transphobic, uh, I'm sorry, the transgender craze seducing our girls. Um, and it's a book that raises, that is, uh, there's demands in libraries across the country to have it removed because it's transphobic. Um, on the other hand, the second most challenged book in North America is All Boys Aren't Blue, which is a memoir by George Johnson of his life growing up black and queer. And then on the other side, there's a demand that this man be canceled every time he appears. This is Jordan Peterson. Uh, so we're getting it from all sides, left, right, center. Uh, what they all have in common is the view that because they find something offensive, you shouldn't be able to read it, right? That's, that's basically the argument. Uh, they ask, you know, libraries first when there's a challenge, and I'm sure, Nancy, you can describe this, but when there's a challenge, uh, request for reconsideration of what they're doing, they look at their selection policy. Every library has a policy by which it selects books. This library, no library, like every other library in Canada, can't have every book that's published, and so they have criteria for choosing. So when there's a request for reconsideration, they look and see, did they make a mistake? Did they somehow violate their policy? If they didn't, then the book remains. Uh, but these folks are saying, well, you decided the book should remain, but we find it offensive. Therefore, none of your patrons should be able to read it, or borrow it, or you should not even have it. The idea of censorship goes back a very long way, as you know. I mean, I'm just going to take you on a quick, arbitrary tour of the history of censorship. Uh, going back to Socrates, um, some of the people challenging all these sex education books and so on were not unlike the people in Athens who sentenced him to death for, his, for corrupting the youth of Athens. Now, Socrates was outspoken, talked about the importance of thinking for yourself. He was a critic of Athenian democracy, and people didn't want the young people of Athens to be able to hear him. So he was put to death. That was in 399 BC. And then there's Qing Shua Huang, the first emperor of China. Uh, he ruled from 2021 BCE to 2010. I mean, I'm sorry, 221 BC, BCE to 210 BCE. Uh, and he was deeply troubled by Confucian philosophy and followers of Confucius who were highly critical of his regime for not upholding the values that uh, Confucian philosophy would have encouraged. And so he launched something called burning the books and burying the philosophers. Uh, it focused primarily on Confucian texts and scholars. He also made ownership of books and books in those days were mainly silk scrolls and bamboo and wooden tablets. They were banned, and leading scholars in these traditions, especially the Confucian tradition, were buried alive. And anyone caught discussing Confucian ideas in the banned books was executed along with members of their family. It was a pretty extreme form of censorship. And then the story all of you know about Galileo. In 
1633, the chief inquisitor who had been appointed by Pope Urban VIII began the inquisition of Galileo. Uh, and he was ordered to turn himself into the holy office to begin a trial for holding the heretical notion that the earth revolves around the sun. Because the Catholic Church knowledge at that time and position and its orthodoxy was that the earth was the immovable center of the universe. So somebody questioning that was questioning something that was really harmful. It's harmful to be said. And so he was to uh, recant from that and uh, not uh, uh, continue perpetrating that view on the pain of torture and death. And then one of the most important books in the history of censorship was the Index of Prohibited Books. It was an index started by the uh, Pope in the 1540s, and it wasn't discontinued until 1966. Okay, so this index, we think of it as early Middle Ages, but it continued until uh, after a number of us uh, were born. Um, now, one of the early titles of it is the one I have on your screen, which I particularly like, the index of authors and books which have been condemned by the Holy Office of the Roman Inquisition and forbidden in all Christendom as either heretical or suspicious or pernicious. Pretty wide range of possibilities there. Democratic revolutions in uh, the 18th century spawned a new wave of censorship after the French Revolution. Writings favor, I mean, the French Revolution scared a lot of uh, autocratic regimes. And so writings favorable to the French Revolution were banned in Spain and Bavaria and Russia and Austria. And in some cases, all books from France were banned. And after the American Revolution, uh, American politics got very politicized. Uh, the Federalists, and that was John Adams, was president. The vice president was Thomas Jefferson, who was a Republican. Um, and the Federalists had control, so totally in opposition to the First Amendment, Congress passed the Sedition Act of 1798 that criminalized, and I quote, false, scandalous, and, mal and malicious writings that brought the president or the Congress, but interestingly it was written, but not the vice president, because he was a Republican, uh, that brought the president or the Congress into contempt or disrepute. Now there's a clear-cut violation of the First Amendment, and it was passed. When Jefferson subsequently got elected president, he rescinded this legislation. You might imagine. But uh, one of the interesting things about the First Amendment, which most of us think of as, as probably the most um, extensive law in the world in terms of protecting freedom of expression, the first Supreme Court decision in the United States that decided on a case in a manner consistent with the wording of the First Amendment, would anybody like to guess what year that was? So the First Amendment was adopted, I think, in 1793. The first time the Supreme Court upheld, made a decision consistent with what it said was in 1931. So despite the wording of policies and in law, censorship can occur. Uh, and in fact, it was shown 120 years later in the United States, during the First World War, the United States government passed the, uh, the Espionage Act act of uh, 1971 that criminalized speech deemed to have the intent to interfere with the operation or success of U.S. armed forces. And then it passed an, a, an, a, an amendment to it, it was called the Sedition Act of 1918, which made it a crime to, and I quote, willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States. Now, under the Espionage Act, the Eugene Debs, who was the leader of the Socialist Party and had been a candidate for president and had received many votes, was sentenced to 10 years in jail. The Espionage Act is still used today. They're trying to extra have Julian Assange extradited from the UK under the provisions of the Espionage Act and to have him tried. So it still exists and it's still used. It was used. Um, against um, 
any, you know, a, a number of people who expose secrets or whistleblowers to the United States. Uh, and it continues to be a form of censorship that you see in the country that legally has the most pervasive protections for freedom of expression. In Tennessee in 1925, many of you will know this from the movie, uh, the state legislature passed the Butler Act, which made it illegal to teach evolution. And the Scopes trial, in which Clarence Darrow uh, was this world famous American lawyer, took on the case to challenge the law and lost. Uh, but that vision is a foretaste of what's happening into American education today. Or in Berlin in May 10th, 1933, this is a bonfire of books. Uh, it was the start of a massive book burning by Nazi dominated student groups of what they called un-German books. Uh, and following the burnings, bookstores, libraries, and publishers' warehouses were raided to confiscate material that was deemed dangerous. Or, some 30 years later, you know about the Cultural uh, Revolution in China. Uh, this is just one of hundreds of images of burning books and, and artifacts uh, that were seen to be upholding what the, what the Maoists called the four olds, the old ideas, the old customs, old culture, and old habits. Uh, and in fact, Mao, shortly before this, made reference to that first Chinese emperor, the first emperor that I had mentioned of, of uh, the unified China, who bragged about how he had put uh, 640 Confucian philosophers to death. Mao bragged that, well, already, and this is before the Cultural Revolution, we have put 64,000 uh, intellectuals to death, a hundredfold what was, what, uh, Ching uh, She uh, Huang had done. So what is censorship? Censorship is the suppression of ideas and information that certain individuals, groups, organizations, or governments feel is objectionable or dangerous. Ideas or information that others must not be allowed to see, read, or hear. Uh, I noticed that uh, the uh, uh, Regina Public Library staff will put out some books out there. One I'd particularly recommend is Eric Berkowitz's, Eric, Ber Eric Berkowitz's book, Dangerous Ideas, because that's what it's about. All these ideas that people, whether it be the people who don't want you to read certain books or making challenge the day, or the Maoists or the Nazis uh, or the Emperor of China, there were things they didn't want you to see because they felt they were dangerous. The demands for censorship I would suggest, are a sign of weakness. They have to be understood as a sign of weakness because they're a confession by those demanding the censorship that they cannot coexist with divergent ideas. It results from a fear of freedom of expression, which is the foundation of democracy. And ultimately, for us in Canada, in a constitutional democracy, censorship is most harmful because it undermines the basis of our political system. Uh, so uh, let me talk first about what freedom of expression is so we're clear what, what I'm talking about. It's the right to express one's views, as well as, and Nancy said this, as well as the right to seek and receive information without interference. In other words, it's the right to speak as well as the right to hear. Uh, I prefer talking about freedom of expression rather than freedom of speech because expression can be in many formats. I mean, it can be oral, as I'm doing now, but it can be in writing, it can be in a form of art or music or theater or a variety of media. The other part of freedom of expression is you have freedom of expression not only with regard to the content, but to the manner of your expression. So if I were an indigenous Canadian, I would be very angry about the uh, racism my people had experienced and I had experienced and continues to be a dominant feature in Canadian life. And so if I'm expressing my uh, dislike, my opposition, my anger about um, racism, anti-Indigenous racism, it's inappropriate and contrary to freedom of expression for you to say, well, it's fine for you to say what you want to say, but you can't say it angrily. 
the manner in which you say something is part of the content of what you're saying. Now, there are limits uh, to what you can do, uh, but the essence of freedom of expression is primarily to remember there's two sides. It's the ability to speak, but also the ability to hear, to have access to resources like in the library. And that's why libraries are such the ardent defenders of expressive freedom because they're the main public institution in a society where people can get resources, whatever their particular interests are, and why it's anathema to a library to make decisions about what should be in their collection based on somebody's politics or religion or whatever. It's to be for the whole community so members of the community can find materials they want to read. The foundation for freedom of expression is in human rights. The most important document, international document, is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was adopted by the United Nations in 1948. That was three years after the United Nations was founded. And it's recognized as one of the signal achievements of the United Nations in its history. A lot of, you can imagine the difficulty of bringing a hundred plus countries together who hadn't been in a, a body of this sort since the League of Nations had died uh, 20 years earlier, having to come to an agreement of what are the list of human rights to which every person on the planet is entitled not because their government gives it to them, but because they're a human being. And that's what this Universal Declaration attempts to identify, the 30 rights that belong to every person unconditionally. And one of them is Article 19, which says everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, that's the library, as well as all your other sources, um, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Liu Xiaobao is one of the greatest human rights activists in the 20th century. He was a Chinese writer, a Chinese literary critic, who spent the last 20 years of his life in a Chinese jail because of his uh, defense and advocacy for human rights. And the Nobel Prize Committee decided to give him the Nobel Prize for his human rights work. The Chinese government would not allow, release him from jail to receive the, go to Stockholm to receive the award. So the uh, committee arranged for it to be presented. They had an empty chair to signify that he was still in jail and gave it to him. And over his life and in his writings, he said many times, the quote that uh, is on the screen, that free expression is the base of human rights, the root of human nature and the mother of truth. To kill free speech is to insult human rights, to stifle human nature, and to suppress truth. If you look at the list of rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I've just put them on the screen for you. There's 30 of them or so. I mean, this is, I'm not sure there's 30 here. Anyways, um, life, liberty, and security of person, not to be held in slavery, not to be tortured, freedom of religion, and so forth. Each of them is essential. And freedom of expression is uh, an intellectual freedom uh, sorry, intellectual and expressive freedom is one of those on the list. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that it's not any more important than the others, but it's the foundation for all of the others. There have been many traditions in human history where the rulers, whether it be the king or a parliament or a self-appointed dictator or whatever, have had prescribed duties that they are to fulfill for their people. The question is, however, what transforms a duty into a right? And there's four things. One, the state has a duty to ensure the right. It cannot be discretionary. So if you say people have a right to freedom of expression and it's up to the king to decide uh, how it is allocated, if at all, it's certainly not a right. It's a duty, an unfulfilled duty. Secondly, there must be a mechanism for the duty to be enforced. So if the ruler doesn't do it, there's a mechanism to force him or her or them to do so. Thirdly, there has to be a mechanism so that if that fails, individuals have the right to uh, the freedom to gather information, to dissent, to mobilize, to campaign, to have that right 
recognize and realize. In other words, they have to have intellectual or expressive freedom. And that, in turn, requires a constitutional democracy. There's not an example in the world of a country with genuine intellectual and expressive freedom that isn't a constitutional democracy. So let's go back to this list. Intellectual and expressive freedom, if a, country, if a government, uh, a king, a ruler of any sort, doesn't uphold their duty to ensure that their citizens have these rights, the only way in which there can be the possibility of compelling to do that, compelling them to do that, is if there's intellectual and expressive freedom. So it's in that sense that freedom of expression really undergirds all the other freedoms, although it's not more important than them. Life, liberty, and security of persons, pretty important, not to be tortured, not to be in slavery. They're all important. So I'm not saying this is more important than the others, but without it, there's no way to help make sure that the others are a reality. And these are all aspirational. I mean, there's no country in the world that fully lives up to this, but we only have a chance of moving in that direction if we have expressive freedom. This is also recognized in the Canadian, by the Canadian law. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which was brought in in 1982, identifies four fundamental freedoms. And they're in section two of the charter. Everyone has the following fundamental freedoms. Freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media communication, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. So our charter recognizes the centrality of freedom of expression as one of our four fundamental freedoms. Now the question is why? Why is it so, why is it uh, embedded in international law, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Why is it embedded in Canadian law? It's also embedded in the tradition of all public libraries, not only in Canada, but around the world. And there are four reasons. One, I, I put up just you. Each one of you, me, every human being in this city and in this country becomes who they are because of our freedom to express ourselves, to hear others' responses to that, we read things, we get different ideas, we try out things, people say, that's a stupid thing you've done, Turk. Um, and you know, you think about it and you say, well, no, you're wrong, I'm gonna keep doing it, or yeah, you're right, maybe, you know, we, through our whole life, we continue modifying, changing who we are and what we believe in various ways. It's what's referred to as self-realization or self-actualization. And that's impeded if we don't have free expression rights. The second is advancement of knowledge. I spent most of my life in universities. And there's hardly a field, hardly a discipline in any university or taught in any university that 100 or 200 years ago, what is understood to be knowledge today in that field wasn't seen as heretical, unimaginable, or of no interest. And we've been able to move forward in our knowledge because of the freedom to raise questions, to challenge ideas, uh, to be accused of being stupid or silly or heretical, but not to be put in prison for it. And maybe 90% of the challenges turn out to be wrong, but we learn things by being able to explore those things. But the 10% that are right. So if you go back and look at a physics book from 1925, uh, two, you know, 100 years ago, it wouldn't look anything like what we teach today. But what we know in medicine, what we know in sociology, what we know in a variety of fields is very different today than what we thought we knew then. And it's because of the rights to freedom of expression, to try out ideas, but also to receive access information to, and to have uh, the ability to challenge conventional wisdom. But thirdly, and I began speaking to that, freedom of expression is essential for democracy. A lot of people talk about democracy, would describe democracy as being about the rule of law, and it is. But even more fundamentally, it's about an ongoing public discourse as to what's legitimate and what's not legitimate. And that public discourse cannot be brought to an end at any point without undermining the democracy. So we vote, we elect a, we elect a government, it has a majority, it can pass laws, we're obligated to abide by those laws, but we don't lose our right to dissent, to criticize, to or mobilize for change. Uh, and the example I've, I've used in my talks uh, at, the, at the Regina Public Library today and yesterday 
uh, comes from a demonstration that I was at in Toronto about, uh, I guess it was about two months ago. Um, the education workers in the Toronto Board of Education were going to go on strike. Not the teachers, but the teaching assistants and the other staff. And our premier, um, Doug Ford, and his government said, we're not going to let that happen. We're going to pass legislation that prohibits them from striking. Now, he was advised correctly that if they brought in that legislation, it would be challenged and it would be found to be unconstitutional as a violation of the charter. So he also announced, we're bringing it in and all, we're going to invoke the notwithstanding clause so as to override the charter. So the Canadian Union of Public Employees, who represents the workers in the Toronto Board, organized demonstrations across the city. And I joined one of the demonstrations. It was at uh, Dundas and Young Street, which if any of you know Toronto is sort of the Times Square of Toronto. And there were about a hundred of us and we moved into the middle of the street to block traffic and the police were there and they knew what we were doing. Um, and people started chanting. Now I'm embarrassed to say I was introduced as having senior positions in the trade union room, which I had done, but I've always been embarrassed by most of the chants you hear at demonstrations. They're pretty, they're not impressive. I, I, whatever, I, I, for those of you who like them, I don't mean to demean them, but um, a chant started there in the middle of Dundas and Young, and it was, this is what democracy is all about. And it struck me, they're absolutely right. Here we live in a society where the government, duly elected government, can pass a law, can invoke a clause in the charter that allows the charter to be overridden, and yet we can be in the street, we can be opposing it, we can be demanding change, we can be organizing against it. And several weeks later, we realized it worked. He withdrew the bill, he withdrew the plans to override it, and reached a, a, a suitable agreement uh, for those education workers. So that's, I mean, democracy can't exist without those expressive freedom rights. And that's what's threatened if it, censorship starts uh, eroding them. And then finally, social justice. Often freedom of expression is counterposed to social justice. I would like to suggest the opposite. Social justice is not possible without freedom of expression. White, cisgendered, reasonably well-off, older white men like myself don't really need constitutional protections for our expressive freedom. We have the ability to have our voices heard. But it's precisely those people who are challenging majoritarian uh, authority and conventional wisdom, who are marginalized, who are feel deeply affronted by what's happening to them in their society, uh, for whom constitutional protections for freedom of expression is particularly important. And if you look at the history of leaders of the anti-colonial movement or the civil rights movement in the United States or the LGBTQ movement in North America, you'll see that many of those leaders understood and spoke about how important constitutional protections for their freedoms were given they were going against majority viewpoints at the time in their own society. There are limits to freedom of expression in Canada, and I won't rattle off all of them. Uh, I mean, you can't, I can't uh, some, be in a political discussion with somebody and they say something I find offensive. I can't punch them in the face and say, well, I'm just expressing my dislike of what you had to say. Uh, I can't threaten violence. Um, you can't counsel suicide. You can't uh, perjure yourself. I mean, there's a variety of criminal code limits, but there are also common law limits. I can't say, well, I saw Nancy breaking into a store last night and uh, have it published in the newspaper because she'll sue me for defamation. Um, noise bylaws, municipal boy, noise bylaws uh, stop me from playing my music at 120 decibels at two in the morning. I mean, there's a variety of limits on our freedom of expression. But in principle, there's a very high bar that our courts impose on any attempt to limit expressive rights. And it's described really well in a decision written by then Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin in a decision in 2001 called R versus Sharp. And I'm just, I'm putting the decision, just the, her few words with regard to how our justice system and how the Supreme Court of Canada understands free expressive rights. And she says, amongst the most fundamental rights possessed by Canadians is freedom of expression. 
it makes possible our liberty, our creativity, and our democracy. It does so by protecting not only good and popular expression, but also unpopular or even offensive expression. The right to freedom of expression rests on the conviction that the best route to truth, individual flourishing, and peaceful coexistence in a heterogeneous society in which people hold divergent and conflicting beliefs lies in the free flow of ideas and images. If we do not like an idea or an image, we are free to argue against it or simply turn away. But absent some constitutionally adequate justification, we cannot forbid a person from expressing it. Because of the importance of the guarantee of free expression, any attempt to, res to restrict the right must be subjected to the most careful scrutiny. And when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is talking about the most uh, careful scrutiny, it's a, a polite way of saying it's a very high bar that something has to go over, be, be above before it can be restricted. Well, those are all the reasons why censorship is a problem. But there's another aspect of censorship and the final aspect I want to address tonight. And that is, not only does it undermine democracy, but it doesn't work. It's ineffective and often counterproductive. So, first of all, censorship can never capture what it wants to prevent. It either tries to define what's restricted too broadly, bringing uh, the basic rights of a society to a halt, or it defines them too narrowly. I'll just give you an example from the writings of Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is one of the most distinguished black intellectuals in the United States. He's a university professor at Harvard. University professor is the designation given to only the very top uh, faculty at, at Harvard, and he's the head of the uh, Af Center for African and African American Research. And he tells a story, uh, I mean, he talks about how, yes, we could restrict epithets, but what's really more harmful in terms of the spread of racism and the uh, diminution of the image of, of uh, people who are attacked is often not those epithets. He gives an example of he's talking with a number of his students in Harvard Yard, uh, his black students. And some guy walks by and says, ah, oh, you F and N, N word uh, people, and storms off. He said, that, you know, that's awful, but that probably demeans him more than us. The next day, though, he's, he goes on to describe one of the student's friends, a white friend, comes up to the group of black students who are with Gates and say, you know, I'm really happy to see all of you here at Harvard. It's wonderful that we have affirmative action policies that allow people like you to be at Harvard. He said, Gates says, you know, that's far more hurtful. And the way in which racism is uh, portrayed or conveyed is often through microaggressions of that side. Whether you're a black person walking down the street and a white person is on the same sidewalk and sees you and crosses the street to walk down the other side. I mean, they're just innumerable stories of that sort. And so Gates, in, in a wonderful article he wrote 20, uh, 30 years ago in the New Republic called Let Them Talk, he wrote, if you really want to penalize wounding words, it makes no sense to single out gutter epithets, which are more likely to stigmatize the speaker than the intended victim and leave them far more painful disquisition alone. The real power commanded by racism is likely to vary inversely with the vulgarity with which it's expressed. In other words, it's the microaggressions. And if we try to shut down every imaginable way in which one could be uh, convey hostile and racist views, we would need to uh, police much of expression that's possible in our society. Secondly, censorship is an attempt to eliminate unwanted views or dangerous views, but it doesn't get rid of them. Racists don't go away because you don't allow them to express their racist views in certain ways. Uh, homophobes don't go away because you find their pamphlets uh, violate the human rights code. All it does is drive them underground where their views are reformulated in different guises and somewhat, sometimes far more virulent guises. Over the long run, if you look at those classic examples of people who were censored historically, they never won. The people who tried to silence Socrates' notions of what's important 
uh, were the losers. Uh, the first emperor of China, I don't know if any of you knew his name, but most of you know who Confucius is, who he was going to sure got written out of world knowledge. Uh, the Nazis burned a lot of books, but ultimately uh, their views are what are stigmatized, including in Germany. Uh, and we still talk about evolution, even though the state of Tennessee made it illegal to do so. So it doesn't work. It also has the effect of drawing more attention to the person or ideas of concern. When I'm giving a talk to librarians, I, I use this example. Most of you probably won't know it. It's a book called Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier. It's called The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. So it's a book that's really critical of trans people and so forth. And it's not a very good book. Um, and most of you would not have read it or even heard it. How many people have even heard of the book? Okay. Well, that's one, two, three. Hold your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I suspect nobody would have put their hand up had this book not been challenged. The reason it gets known is because of the challenge. And all sorts of people, when, when you're told a book uh, has to be censored, you want to read it. Sales of her book, the best, the people who wanted to censor her book did her more favors in terms of the sales of her book than anything she could have ever done. As well, it denies people like me who are very trans positive the right to read what trans phobes are writing in order to be able to be, have articulate criticism of those points of view. It also often, censorship often victimizes those it intends to help. There's lots of examples of that. Hate speech laws, which exist in a lot of countries, in more authoritarian countries are used to jail journalists, opposition uh, politicians, critics of the government, um, and uh, human rights advocates. As I was having dinner, I was reading my Globe and Mail on my phone, and the government of Zimbabwe yesterday passed a law that basically says nobody is allowed to say anything critical of the, they're going into an election, and in the election period, nobody's allowed to say anything critical of the president or of the government, including the opposition, or they're jailed. The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance reported in 2015 that hate speech prohibitions may have been disproportionately and unjustifiably used against those whom they are intended to protect. The United Kingdom was one of the first countries to introduce hate legislation, hate speech legislation. And all the people initially charged under it were members of the Black Liberation Front charged by whites for being racist. In the 1990s, which was an early, earlier period when we had the same kind of wave of censorship that we're facing now, a number of American universities developed speech codes to try to reduce the racism on campus. And probably the best, the most carefully written, the most thoughtful was at the University of Michigan. And during the first year, and only lasted the first year because they were all found to be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. During the first year, um, more than 20 blacks were charged under this speech code with being engaging in racist speech. And not a single instance of, white, of a white person being charged. So it protected no black person and subjected a number of them to problems. Also, it tends to create free speech martyrs in the public's mind. Uh, my favorite example, and I apologize to those of you who like his work, I don't, uh, is Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson has become very rich as a result of attempts to silence him. He's gotten, done so well, he's been able to give up his very lucrative senior professor position at the University of Toronto. And if you go onto his website, there's a variety of ways in which you can give him money. And there was an investigative journalist who looked into this and tracked every time there was a, a press report of, a, of Jordan Peterson event being canceled, the money that flowed in through his account increased by about $25,000 that next week, 25,000 US, the next week. Um, his books have been a bestseller on the bestseller list for a long time. And the publicity he gets from these attacks on him I was in Edmonton when he was uh, supposed to give a talk at the Citadel Theater. 
And there was a movement of progressive folks who I would claim to be as well, but I don't agree with what they did. I mean, they, they actually got the Citadel not to cancel the event. So the people who organized, I mean, Peterson and, and his buddies rented a much bigger space at a ne nearby hotel and filled to overflowing because of all the publicity that had gotten over the censorship. The censorship also does a harmful thing in the sense, and I mentioned this earlier with regard to Abigail Schreier's book, it denies everyone else the right to see and confront ideas and people. Uh, it diminishes our ability to see what they're arguing so we can develop our counter arguments. It develops, it denies us the right to uh, have the kind of critical analysis and awareness that's essential for democratic discourse and decision making. Censorship next to the last raises the most fundamental question, and that is who in society should have the authority to decide what everyone else can see and hear. The fact that I don't like a book, that I find it harmful, that I find it uh, offensive, does that give me the right to ensure you can't see it? I hope it doesn't. And then finally, censorship gives the illusion that you're doing something useful when you're not. So if you're concerned about racism in our country as I am, I would love it if we could just pass laws that stopped all racist expression and that would eliminate racism. But it doesn't do that. If we're serious about eliminating racism, we have to deal with the fundamental social, cultural, and economic inequality in our society. We have to deal with our, we have to find some solution to our deeply flawed criminal justice system. Those are hard things to do. And lots of people who are anti-racist think they've done their bit by censoring racist speech. And it gives the illusion and diverts us from the real things we have to be addressing if we want to be successful in dealing with racism. So I have a closing comment. And it's first to say that I'm delighted that this talk is being given in the Regina Public Library. Public libraries have a core responsibility to help ensure that all persons in their communities have access to the full range of knowledge, imagination, ideas, and opinions so they can meaningfully participate in public discourse on which genuine democracy depends. This is everyone's human right to have access to those materials. Intellectual freedom and free expression rights are protection for the marginalized, making demands for, so for social change, and challenging majoritarian authority. Banning protection for intellectual freedom and free expression undermines the very possibility of social justice and genuine democracy. Thank you very much.